Dumb Clock. <coughs> and today's talk is part two of the Thousand Petrol Motors, where we will find what's at the heart of that Thousand Petrol Motors. Who's responsible? And continuing on from yesterday's exciting episode. <laughs> Look, we've been giving Dharma talks almost every day for the last 20, 30 years. <laughs> of course you will add an experts, maybe not to entertain you, but at least to entertain you. <laughs> so, going back to the, uh, the structure of the simile. A uh, lotus closed at night time and it opens up because it receives the heat and the light of the sun. Petal by petal, layer by layer, it opens up. When one layer of petals is open, it allows the next layer of petals to receive the warmth and light of the sun and therefore open up. And the deeper you go into those petals, the more profound uh, is, the, is what you see and what you smell. Those petals are very refined and very um, uh, delicate and also they're incredibly beautiful and full of fragrance but they have to go very deep inside to get the really juicy petals. And that's similar to the opening our minds in meditation. It is the light and warmth representing the mindfulness and the kindness is what opens up our body and mind as we don't go on to the next layer of petals. We don't go on to the next stage of meditation. We only go in and in and in, which is why we call this insight meditation. If you get uh, really emotionally charged, we call that excite meditation. We get excited. So we go in and in and in to see what's right at the centre of things. And so, as we do this, always continuously, all we do is to be aware and be kind. And yesterday I was just getting into the, the breath and a very smooth and peaceful breath. But I never said much about why sometimes we get distracted. It is the case that there you are being really peaceful, really still. Things are happening. And then bang! And somebody uh, bangs the door. Or <coughs> somebody comes. Or you may be in a room and the upstairs neighbour decides to make a cup of tea at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> There's so many things and ways to disturb you. But, as Ajahn Chah used to say, it says, not the sound disturbs you. You are the one who disturbs the sound. <coughs> what does that mean? And so often that when we are meditating or even sleeping or studying whatever you're doing in your life, it is like we have a screen. Imagine a screen. And what you are is in the middle. It's what you're settled on. It's not what you force yourself to put the attention on. It's just what attracts you. It's peaceful. It's beautiful. So when you're, say, watching the breath and you get into it, the breath is beautiful, it's like on the centre of your screen. Then when you do walking meditation, <coughs> you're walking, feeling <coughs> the, the uh, sensations of your feet or just the muscles as they're walking, it gets really quite pleasant. Because it's pleasant, it's easy to watch. But then something happens, you hear a sound outside of you. Or you may feel a, an ache in your body or something. You hear something but make sure you don't bring them to the centre of your screen. 
In other words, don't make a big deal out of them. Because what happens is this. I got this simile from spending a long time travelling around on aircraft. Sometimes it doesn't matter what you have to do in your life, there's always opportunities to find great similes, meanings, ways which you can explain difficult phenomena to yourself and to others in life. So this was seeing a screen in the front of the seat you know, when I was uh, taking off to go somewhere in the <coughs> And they said, you must watch the safety video. All aircraft are different. Doesn't matter how many times you fly, I don't know how many, how many times I've heard that information, but because I'm a well-behaved monk, sometimes, <laughs> well, I decided to watch it. And something interesting happened. When I sort of started focus on the screen, it was only a small screen, then, after a while, the upholstery of the seat in front of me disappeared. And I was just focusing, I was zooming in on the screen. And then the plastic, which was the, uh, the rim of the TV screen, the edge, that disappeared as well. As I focused in and I zoomed in and then I noticed my mind stopped zooming. As it was just the image on the screen, just filled my mental space, so I could watch the uh, in-flight uh, safety demonstration. And I began to notice, it does not depend upon how big the screen is. But these days sometimes you see these huge um, TV screens or whatever they are, on the motorways, just in the uh, cities, huge screens. But whatever size they are, I notice when I look at them, my mind zooms in and stops just so it can fit into the screen. So it really doesn't matter how big the screen is. To the point that I've told many people, if when you go home, if you like TVs, you don't need to buy a huge, uh, big screen TV. Just a small one would be good enough. Of course, when I say you want to buy uh, big TVs, it's not to watch movies or TV shows, it's only to watch our channel on YouTube. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> oh. But anyway, now people just do watch that stuff. So, you notice that phenomenon just fitting in. And what's not important? falls off the edge of the screen. And I use that simile to help with meditation, especially in noisy places, or even sometimes when you have aches and pains in the body. Because by focus, what's really important, after a while, when you say you're watching your breathing, you're on that level of petals, and when you actually get to that number of petals, sometimes it's almost like that there's a bee buzzing around on the outside. Mm -hmm. And there's some distraction, someone's making a noise, they're coughing or they you can't stop people being noisy. It's their nature. It's like telling the dog not to bark. That's what they do. So people make noises from time to time. We try and limit it as much as possible. And then you meditate and hear the noise. What many people do is that they grab that noise and put it into the centre of their screen. They zoom in on the noise. And they start to say, who's that? I've got to find out who they are. I've got to tell the, the manager to actually find out who they are. Three strikes and you're out. <laughs> you're blacklisted, you can never come on this retreat ever again. And that's, that's not compassion, there must be some other way. It's just like sometimes that I'm not sure where you are staying in this complex. There may be people in the same room as you or next door who snore. And maybe you can hear them through the walls snoring. And people have asked me, can you please get a list of notorious 
chronic snores. So that we can, whenever they come on one of my retreats, we can put them in this one particular wing of a complex. They can snore merrily together <laughs> and not disturb the rest of us. But of course that doesn't work at all. We have other ways of doing it. So instead we just focus. Allow ourselves just to be. So with our breath, if you're going to bed at night, you're about to fall asleep, just with whatever you do before you fall asleep, just you know what I did before I fall asleep? I wish myself, have a good night's sleep, I don't know. <laughs> See you in the morning. <laughs> that works. It's not craziness. Because when you wish yourself a good night's sleep, you are always, and I don't know, you may be, be with a partner in life, but when you're by yourself, you're with a partner, you're the last one you're aware of before you fall asleep. So I tell myself, good night, have a good night's sleep. Then you sleep well. When you wake up in the morning, hi, good morning, have a great day, I said, bro. <laughs> nice to see you again. And even sometimes, sometimes you feel a bit, you know, just a bit down, a bit weak, um, weak in energy. And sometimes you feel, oh, it's really difficult, you try your hardest and no one loves you. So, like you can do this right now. Put your hands out, follow me. <laughs> Put your hands out, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. It's all good hug. There's two advantages of hugging yourself. Number one, you don't get taken to court for <laughs> abuse. <laughs> Not much point to suing myself. And number two, you don't catch anything. <laughs> I don't know what diseases people have got these days. <laughs> so you can always hug this off, it's really nice. So anyway, just uh, going to um, sleep at night, you can get yourself a nice peaceful uh, state of mind. And then if there are sort of any, any distractions, don't bring them into the centre. If you bring them into the centre, they grow and grow and grow. They're the ones which develop. So if you're watching the breath, I hear some noise, it's over there somewhere. Do it over there. Here's someone sort of coughing, it's over there somewhere. But I'm just happily in the centre. A uh, Malaysian couple, disciples, over in Perth. I, they sort of gave the, the gold standard simile for how this works. They were watching a movie in their home. And they were really into the movie, they were sitting on the sofa, really watching it. And of course, once the movie was finished, they go up, one to just go to the toilet, the other one to make a cup of tea or coffee or something. It's only when they got up from the sofa, they looked that their living room was different. There was many valuable things were missing. You guessed it, a burglar had been into their house, no joke, no exaggeration, into the room where they were sitting watching the TV taking stuff, valuable stuff, from the shelves right behind their sofa. And I told them, I said, you're supposed to be meditators, if you could only do that when you were meditating. <laughs> you able to see it, people come and go, and you don't hear anything. So what was the difference there? They'd actually focused in on the TV, and they couldn't hear anything outside of the TV. Even their thirstiness, wanting a cup of tea or needing to go to the toilet, they just don't feel that. Because they're focused on something which is very all embracing, encompassing. Why? Because of the joy, the interest in whatever it was they were watching. So, a lot of times, to avoid distractions so that they don't really upset you and disturb you. 
Don't disturb them. Don't bring them into the centre of things. Keep on this delightful breath. Watching the breath go in and go out. Nothing else to do. And you do hear the sound. But don't bring it into the centre. Sometimes you get excited. Sometimes you can hear your heartbeat. Don't put it into the centre. Keep the centre on the peaceful breath. And then what will happen? As you focus it more, the awareness of the heartbeat will just literally fall off your radar. It will drop off the screen. And you won't even notice it. If you're watching the breath and there's like an ache or pain in the body, an itch in your nose or something, then just don't be into the centre. It's over there somewhere. The body will look after it. Keep on your breath and after a while you just don't know it's there, it's gone. It falls off the radar. But whatever you focus on, whatever is in the centre of your screen, remains as you zoom in on it. Whatever's on the edge falls away and disappears. It's the nature of just focusing, but don't use willpower. Make it attractive, what's in the centre. And then it happens with so much peace. I know that I never fully answered the question last night of, you know, please help me dealing with ghosts. Because I remember, <laughs> recall this one instance when I was meditating in the jungle. I mean, actually did actually meditate, it was jungle. Some of the places I went to. I remember one of them, the last remnant, a uh, piece of rainforest in the northeast in Nankai province. <coughs> Beautiful. And whenever you go into rainforest, really natural rainforest, it's always fragrant. There's always some flower or shrub uh, in blossom, blooming. And it was so cool and fragrant walking to those old rainforests. But any <coughs> sorry. Uh, anyway, but you know, when you would meditate there, I was meditating there one night. And I heard it was pitch black, there's no electric lights, so even starlight that time. If there was, the canopy of the trees was so thick that you know, hardly any, any starlight, maybe a moonlight could come through, but nothing else. So I was sitting there and I heard the sound of a, an animal coming towards me. There's so many animals, this is their home, not my home. An animal was coming towards me, and so just you know, my attention, my awareness went out to the animal. What type of animal is it? Is it safe? And straight away I realised, it's only a small animal. So I closed my eyes and kept on meditating, watching my breathing. And then, as it came closer, I heard it approaching me. And I realised that maybe it wasn't a small animal at all. It had to be something bigger, but not dangerous. Maybe like a mouse deer, civet cat, a small animal, not a danger. So I just carried on meditating. And as it came closer, I listened to it again. This was not a small animal, it was quite large size. I started to get afraid. And as it came closer, you could hear by just how it crunched the twigs and the leaves on the forest floor and as it brushed past the bushes and the trees. This was a big animal. And at that I really started, my heart started pounding. Because I was always told by people like Ajahn Chah that no monks get eaten by tigers in the jungle. And then, but I really thought, because I was always uh, very logical and sometimes cynical, and rebellious, I thought, well, how would you know? <laughs> Those which were eaten <laughs> would just disappear, and the tigers would confess. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't reassure me. And there were tigers in those jungles. And so I got scared. So I picked up you know, my torch, flashlight. And I shine, you know, expecting to see these big eyes of a tiger. And I just didn't know what I was going to do next. But anyway, I was looking, I couldn't find it, and I finally found it. It was a tiny mouse about this big. That's what it was. And I was very mindful 
I investigated the sound as clearly as I possibly could. For when you're alone in the darkness and fear comes up, it is the fear anxiety makes the sound of a tiny mouse become a huge monkey-eating tiger. <laughs> That's what fear does. It exaggerates and amplifies. And it certainly caught me out there. So whenever you hear any sounds in the night time, it's amazing how many times it's just your digestion. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a ghost, it's not. Don't be exaggerate. Be careful of that. But anyway, back down to the... Um, so if you are distracted anyway, just find something really beautiful and delightful during your meditation. And then it becomes almost a little bubble you live in. Beautiful breath, just walking, kindness, loving kindness, and you just don't hear anything else. Even your body just starts to vanish. So this is one of the many reasons why the delight and happiness is a crucial part of the development of meditation. Otherwise, thoughts will come and straight away you grab the thought put it in the middle. And it starts a whole process of training thought, as they say. If you keep the thoughts out here somewhere, yeah, you can sort of hear them. But the thoughts are way over there. And you're focusing on the beautiful silence and the breath in the present moment. And the thoughts literally fall off the screen. Don't try and push them out. If you push them out, you're giving them importance and they will take centre stage. The other thing with thoughts, it's amazing just how, with the screen simile, but how we get sucked in to drama. As I said the other day, we love drama. That's why we like gossiping. Hey, have you heard that that girl in the corner over there, she's got jarvis? Nah, no way. She may say so, but not her. I know her, you don't know her. <laughs> Why do you bother about stuff like that? She's got exactly what that's her business. We like drugs. We like seeing, you know, what's happening with Brexit. Have you heard what the latest news on Brexit? Who cares? <laughs> but it's not any worrying about it, is that gonna make any difference? Are you the Prime Minister? Are you the head of the European Union? Whatever. It doesn't bother you because you can't do anything. That's one of the things which the Dalai Lama said. Only worry about things where you can make a difference. If you can't change anything, why worry about it? But if you can worry about something, you can make a difference, like you know, shutting up and meditating, worry about that. Because <laughs> that's where you can make a difference. But people love getting excited, getting, getting uh, uh, enraged sometimes. It's one of the reasons why people get angry. Because there's a pleasure of anger, a delight. You're there, you're existing. You've got a purpose in life to demonstrate. That's why I demonstrated a couple of times, but I really didn't like it. I preferred oh, okay, so that, no, Ajahn Brahmani wouldn't mind me telling this story. <laughs> now Ajahn Brahmani, you've seen Ajahn Brahmani in the previous retreats. He was, he's got a, a Masters in Business Studies. And he decided to put his education to good benefit when there was a demonstration in Norway. So he bought some eggs and he put them on sale at the demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> Throw at the police. <laughs> oh, I thought that was really brilliant. You know, that's, he saw a niche market that could make some
<laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway oh, that's a bit talking about meditation. And, uh, so anyway, we, because we like drama, so sometimes we get caught up in it. Get caught up in it. Get entangled in it. Because this was, uh, again, just for my lifestyle, I usually, when I travel, like when I come back from here to Australia, usually go through Singapore Airport because I got many disciples in Singapore and they help me with some of the tickets and stuff. So, because of that, that sometimes, many times, I'll be walking through from one uh, terminal, one gate to another gate in Changi Airport, and in Terminal 3, in the very centre, Terminal 3, this what they call the sports lounge. And there they play continuously, mostly uh, uh, EPL soccer matches. And I walk past there so many times and see this some football match on this huge screen and see all of these mostly men sort of every now and again jumping up. That was offside! That was not a goal! Ref, are you blind? No, they're jumping up and down, really getting excited, and there's two things which I noticed about the soccer match. Number two, it was a replay. <laughs> it happened a couple of days ago. <laughs> so all the shouting, it's all over and finished. And number two, they, they shouted pretty loud. But I don't know how loud you have to shout in Singapore to be heard <laughs> in Anfield, <laughs> Liverpool, <laughs> half a world away. <laughs> the ref can't hear you. <laughs> and anyway, it's all finished. <laughs> but that doesn't stop them shouting. And I often wonder what the psychology of that was. And it's not just guys. No, this was you know, my experience when I was growing up. You know, one occasion we went to a cinema, it was in, um, yeah, it was in uh, Cambridge. You know, a few of my friends, with our girlfriends, and we went to see West Side Story, if you remember that story. And it was a weepy, a doomed love affair. And so, you know, it's not one based on Romeo and Juliet, in, in uh, the east side of New York. No, it's on the west side of New York, poor place. And anyway, I do, do remember the characters, Tony and Maria, from opposite side of the tracks. I think Tony is Italian, Maria, Puerto Rican. And anyway, at the end of the show, they fell in love. And then some, you know, things happened, so it was complicated. If you think John is complicated, <laughs> love affairs are <laughs> far more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, eventually, uh, Maria's brother had a gun and was looking for Tony to shoot him. And Maria was also looking for Tony to warn him. And they were wandering around the streets on the west side somewhere. It was dark, it was rainy. And then Maria found the love of her life, Tony, standing under a, a street lamp lamppost lit a night time and shouted out to Tony Bickett before she finished the sentence. <coughs> a shot rang out into the silent New York East Side, West Side night and it hit Tony and Maria ran towards the love of her life, held him in her arms she didn't try and call for an ambulance or anything like that. <laughs> anything sensible. <laughs> she didn't apply in the first day, try and stem the, the bleeding. <laughs> Instead, she held him and started singing. <laughs> <laughs> I have never read that in any first day. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere in the streets of New York, around midnight somewhere, there was an orchestra. 
<laughs> which accompany the singing. And it's a place for art. It's a place for art. And all my, all my girlfriend started weeping. <laughs> and all our sensitive guys started laughing. It's only a movie! Come on, he's not really dead. Now you know I was a Buddhist at the time. You know, so I told our girlfriends, look, if you don't believe in reincarnation, just wait for another 15 minutes when the movie starts again. He's <laughs> been totally reincarnated. <laughs> but you know, it's you know, being a bit sort of mean to your girlfriend. But why? Why did they start to get emotionally entangled in the movie? Same reason why guys get emotionally entangled in a football match the other side of the world. We get sucked into the action. Guys, you know, watching a movie a long way away, the psychology is that they're in the, the match, they're on the stands, it's happening right in front of them, it's live. Do you remember the, uh, the first movies which were done by the Lumiere brothers? Apparently it was a train, they filmed a train coming into a station. And as it was coming, it's just a screen. The people, the first people who watched that movie, they were scared. They actually took cover because they assumed that the train was actually coming right towards them. Because they'd never seen like a movie before. The, the couple who took us to Oxford, uh, Nick and Mary, that they have a little dog. And every time, the dog actually likes nature channels, seeing elephants and tigers and stuff. <laughs> but every time, it seems like a tiger on the TV. <laughs> it runs behind the TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> But we're, we're not that different. We get sucked in and we can't make that distinction that this is not real. That's why we get sucked into thoughts, fantasies, plans <coughs> and memories. It's not real. We get sucked into it as if it's happening all over again. That's why if we can somehow disentangle from this series of thoughts, through the fantasies, through the script of a movie in which we are asked to hear. To think disentangled, to stand back, it's just a movie, that's all. Then we find it so easy to let them go. It's a movie. I once watched Armageddon on the Infrared movie. But I never put the sound on. I just watched the picture. And I was laughing my head off. <laughs> Honestly, it just was one of the most greatest comedies I've ever seen. <laughs> it's supposed to be the end of the world. But you knew what's going to happen. All the end of the world pictures, always, just at the last, not last minute, the last second. The hero, who usually has to be an American, <laughs> saves the world. You know what's going to happen? They get close to losing, but then at the very end, the last moment, they win. So I knew what was going to happen before it started. And what really was so ridiculous, I remember seeing it on the screen, this space craft and it had to head towards this was it asteroid or comet or something something which was which was heading straight for planet earth and when it actually something malfunctions what's that kind of malfunctions otherwise it's not interesting if anything goes according to plan you know, where's the drama so if everything went according to plan in this retreat it would be interesting would it if you got John on the first day and just and everything went perfect you know what would be the point 
But anyway, some of you are thinking, well, no, that's never happened to me before, let's actually give it a try. But anyway, the spacecraft hit the big crossing lot. It crashed. <coughs> there were sparks and there was flashes of light and flames everywhere. It tumbled all over the place. It was absolutely mayhem. And then it almost came to a, a halt and then it fell over a cliff. A really big cliff, not a small one, just hundreds of meters and it was smashing around and smoke and sparks and flames everywhere. It was total destruction. If even a tiny bit of that happened to a car on the M1, that would be eternal. Yet. But no no. It went quiet. And then Inside the spacecraft, a little hand came up, <laughs> pulled himself up. It was the hero. Not a speed of sweat on his face. <laughs> Not any soot marks from all the explosions. <laughs> and what really made me burst out in uncontrollable laughter, his hair was perfect. <laughs> And all the other people, oh, he survived, oh, what a relief. <laughs> they thought I was mad, crazy. They're the ones who are mad being sucked into all that stuff. But anyway, that is the problem with distracting thoughts. We want to be distracted. We want fantasy. We prefer fantasy to reality. That's why we allow ourselves to get sucked in. We want to be on the, the stands of the cop in Atfield. We want to be in the movie. We want to be shouting out. One of the movies I remember was Tarantula. Look out! Tarantula's behind you! They can't hear on the movie. Still people shout out. So this is one of the reasons why we get in because we want to be part of the action. So instead, we stay inside our little centre, peaceful, kind, gentle, happy, just watching our breaths go in, go out. If anything happens outside, it's what somebody told me, this uh, mother, her son always kept using this term, Nanya, have you cleaned up your room yet? Mum, Nanya. Have you taken the trash out? And the son replied to his mother, Nanya. Have you done your homework? Nanya, Mum. Nanya, Mum. Do you know what Nanya <coughs> so, you know meant? It was actually teenage speak. Until she finally discovered it meant it was short for Nanya business. None your business, Mum. None your business. She wouldn't say that, I was rude. So, she learned a new word, and I learned a new word. So sometimes when people ask me, sort of, you know, how are you, Rachel, Mum? Nanya. When are you coming back again to England? Nanya. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy the retreat? Nanya. <laughs> no, don't do that, that's rude. But anyway, that uh, I like that word because any sound or talking, someone else is doing it, it's not my business. So I stay in my little bubble, that's my business. Peace, quietness. So as you're doing that, you're watching your breath. You stay long enough, you go deeper into the meditation, it becomes delightful. In the fifth and sixth stages of Anapanasati, it's called you experience pity and sukha, joy and happiness, along with the breath. That's what it says. It's not, it doesn't actually say you develop it, you experience it. It's part of the natural process. You don't seek for it, you can't stop it, it just happens. When you're really peaceful, energy goes into the knowing it's taken away from the doing. When you have more and more energy, things begin to look delightful. 
the bright beams, just the, the grass, flowers, the sunsets, everything starts to look beautiful. And we say we develop, sort of experience that Chitta Sankara. It's a bit of party, but there's a few people here who ask me questions on the party. It's a mind made phenomena. It comes from the Chitta, the mind. The breath is beautiful, delightful or happy. It's how your mind perceives it. <coughs> Basically, what the mind adds to the breath. That's where it's coming from. So don't deny it. Don't try and something must be going wrong. I'm enjoying the meditation. That can't happen. It does. So you're watching the breath. The mind looks at it as beautiful. Beautiful breath going in, breath going out. It's joyful. And you settle that down and it gets very, very peaceful and deep. And sometimes you start to wonder, am I really watching the breath? And what am I watching? What you're watching is how the mind experiences the breath, not how the body feels the breath. You switch from one sense base to another. It's not experiencing the breath as a touch. It's experiencing the breath as a knowing. Beautiful knowing. That's why some people get a bit confused. Ah, oh, the breath has disappeared, I can't find the breath. Well, what are you watching? You're watching something, you're not dead, you're not unconscious. What are you experiencing? Oh, it's just peaceful, it's nice. Great. That's the start of the mind, perceiving the breath, rather than the body feeling the breath. <coughs> Very clear in Anapana, here this evening, in the uh, St. Patana. Oh, I'll just flip a few pages to actually to show you that uh, in the Anapana Sati Sutta. But that's what happens. The body sense base is shutting down. The mind, sense base, is taking over. We're trying to calm down the five senses. Most of the senses have been calmed down already. The body is the hardest one in this sense, or in this case. So we go into the breath, a natural progress, there's a stepping stone from the body to the breath, from the breath to the mind. So then, what happens next? We go deeper into the lotus. The deeper you go, the more refined, the thinner the petals. And then as you go deeper, you don't do anything. <coughs> if you do something, you just interfere with the process. I did say this simile on the first night, but again, it's another aircraft simile. The benefits of being a frequent flyer. And that was this uh, little story about the aircraft of the future. Remember that in the cockpits, in future aircraft, there'll only be two beings. Did I say that here or was it in London? Uh, no, London. Oh, London, okay. Yeah. In future aircraft, there'll only be two beings in the cockpit, and the door will be locked. No entry or exit. And the two beings in the cockpit, one will be the pilot, and the other one will be a dog just a pilot and a dog in a cockpit. The only job and purpose of the pilot is to feed the dog. And the only job of the dog is to bite that pilot if he touches anything. <laughs> to stop him interfering. And sometimes, if it was possible, when you were meditating, I would like to put a little dog in your brain to buy you, if you do anything, especially when we start to get into deep meditation. You're about to do something. You're about to what? You're about to put some effort. You know, take that. In other words, to let go, let the process happen, stop interfering. Because it's true that most aviation experts know that the biggest cause of 
of problems and crashes is human error. We get involved, we interfere. So, <coughs> you know meditation, especially you get to things like the life of prayer, stop interfering. It is the you already established some mindfulness and kindness, let it just blossom. It's nice opening up. And after we get these delightful breaths, just be the what can be more relaxing and peaceful than that? It's quite satisfying and content. Breathing in, breathing out. And the more content you are, the more delight you feel. The less possible that any thoughts or any disappearance can disturb you. You relax. Just like the guitar string no pressure, no tension on the guitar string, it's so loose, doesn't make a sound. And something hits it. Your mind is just so relaxed, someone bangs the door, you just can't hear it. It doesn't resonate. You need tension to resonate this bell. So much tension in the surface of the bell, that's why I just flick it. Doesn't make it, it makes a big sound. This is so soft. Actually, did make a sound. <laughs> no sound at all. So, nothing disturbs you. You soon get it inside. I'm very happy inside. Self contained, if you want to call it that. And then what happens next is as, as the, the, uh, the delight builds and builds and builds you start to see what we call the Nimitta. The ninth stage of Anapanasati, Chitta Pati Samwedi. You experience the mind, the radiant mind, the bus of the mind. You see it usually, most people see it, it's a beautiful light. The Nimittas. They said last night that when people die, you see Nimittas. The beautiful light of the five senses disappear. But it's much better to start to experience those lights. Now all it is, is your five senses are being subdued. The beautiful lights come up instead. <coughs> so my, the reason we see it as the lights, they are not seen from your eyes. It's just pure mind object, but it's just how the mind interprets things. They see it as light because <coughs> sorry, the light is the dominant sense. Now we notice people on passports by their images, facial recognition, not by their smells. That's how your dog recognises you. Oh yeah, that's you. <laughs> so this is our dominant sense base. So we interpret this beautiful mind when it comes up as a light. Doesn't matter what colour it is. I should actually say that it is possible to interpret the nimitta, you know, this beautiful light, you know, as a physical feeling of bliss. But it is not as reliable as using a light, as you know, how you interpret things. Because we don't have as much experience in our life with um, physical feelings. Somebody they say, can it be experienced as a sound? They can, but again, that's, you know, it has to be some really unworldly sound, beautiful, thrilling. Something out of the ordinary, because you can miss it. But they never notice, mention that sometimes it can appear as a spell. People go very deep in meditation. They say to me that sometimes they, they can experience a smell of like sandalwood or um, lotus and it's no, <coughs> so no flowers in the meditation hall no one is using deodorants or scents or fragrances it's very powerful they hear and first I thought this is heavenly beings they're smelling and I first of all I thought oh maybe but then I realised it's not any heavenly beings it's just your mind is so powerful you're experiencing the mind 
and you're making a connection between one of the most favourite smells which you've experienced. But this is not a smell, it is not a sound, it is not a feeling, it is not a visual object, it's the mind. And just how we perceive it through interpretation. But when that comes up, for most people it is an emitter, a light. And when they really develop, you know for sure it's an emitter. <coughs> when classic is, it's more deep than you can ever see in the real world. If it's white, it's incredibly deep white, lighter than white, more yellow than yellow. Deeper blue than you've ever experienced before. It's just what people know is like spiritual experiences. Not of this world because it's like blue upon blue, really deep, very powerful. And those limiters, when they come, they can be all sorts of shapes and sizes and stuff. Eventually, we want to try and arouse the, the simple ones. But just to let you know the sort of limiters which can occur. A couple of years ago, when I was meditating in my cave during a retreat period, when I got a nimitta, and as soon as I saw it and recognised it, my whole meditation just fell apart, and I was laughing my head off. I think I'm the only meditator ever to experience this nimitta. Because it was getting very, very peaceful, the breath was vanishing, this beautiful light came into my mind. It was yellow. A really deep yellow, I didn't recognise where this is in the land. Beautiful, powerful, and it was yellow, but it had a shape. And when I recognised its shape, that's when I started laughing, and the whole experience of the meditation fell apart, and I was laughing for hours afterwards. It was an image of Garfield the cat. <laughs> <laughs> I've been reading too many cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm the only monk who's had the Garfield limiter. <laughs> and it was real limiter because incredibly powerful yellows, some black lines, really clear, sharp delineation of its ears <laughs> and its, you know, its eyes with you know, half the, the eyelids covering it. <laughs> and the fat belly, maybe that's why I relate to Garfield. But anyway, it was Garfield Limiter. So it's just I didn't, because of my perception of being, being taken up with reading, sort of, because <laughs> when I look at newspapers, I look at the news, it's all the news, it's the same tragedies, the same scandals, the same dramas, just different characters, that's all, different actors acting out the same play. But anyway, so <laughs> that just totally broke. But when, what really happens is when you have the limiter arising, beautiful light, you're going deeper in to the, the lotus flower. This is the world of just the mind. And your job is to basically stabilize the limiter so it doesn't move all over the place. And basically purify it, keep it simple, joyful. It's one of the reasons why the most simple type of limiter is way of looking at the mind. It's just like a little sphere on a disc. Single light, brilliant. And two problems which comes up. Fear, excitement. This is straight from the Upikaleza Sutta, which is one to eight in the Matinee Kaya. And I quote that because so often people complain, Ajahnma, there's no mention of limiters in the Sutta. They read the suit, there's no limiters mentioned there. It's whole 128 Upakalesa Sutta is all about limiters. I did argue with the translator on that, but instead of actually translating it in Pali, limiters, because that's what's there, he translated it as that thing. <laughs> so people miss it all the time. They wait for it, there's not mentioned limiters here, it's in the footnotes. Just like the insurance contract, it's in the footnotes. And it's in the footnotes there. So this refers to limiters. It's all about how to deal with limiters in that particular stage of meditation. Rupa Kalesa Sutta. 
And there I was teaching to especially the two major things, fear and excitement. Excitement and love. Yes. You blown it. <laughs> you got excited. Often your heart starts pumping, pop, 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 pop. You've lost it. Mm -hmm. Just let the heartbeat just fall off the screen. You just stay in the beautiful limiter. Or just uh, the fear. This is big stuff. And you've got to actually mention this is huge spiritual depth. Powerful stuff you're experiencing. And sometimes people say, well, maybe for monks and nuns, but not for me, it's a bit too much for me, come on. It's not too much for you, go for it, it's totally safe, powerful. Just things which have happened to me, that sometimes you look at that light, it's just so incredibly bright, it's like looking at the sun, but much brighter than the sun. I'm going to go blind. That's not why I wear glasses, by the way, looking mm -hmm. to me, because it's... No, it, it's, a, it's a mental object, it's not seen through the sun, it can be bright as you like, it doesn't do any damage at all. And the other thing, the power of it, the bliss of it, I mean this is really incredible ecstasy. And I must have been in London where I said this is a fellow who's trying to get off um, heroin addiction. He did so well, so many days he was free, and then he said you know, a thousand times a day he has to say no. Only one, once he, has to, he says yes, and he's back on the addiction again. Such a hard thing to break. But anyway, the reason I tell the story, because you know, he came up to me one day and he said, Ajahn Brahma, I know you're famous for saying that there's even a limit of that, no, no, the uh, jhanas, a limit of that on the jhanas, and please spell them sexual orgasm. How to say that, it's true. And, he said, well, yeah, I thought so, maybe, I have to accept that. But I never ever thought that in the middle land there's more bliss than heroin. Yeah, that's why I get addicted, because heroin is way, way more powerful ecstasy than sex. And now I've discovered a, a bliss, a delight, which is even better than heroin. And that was the beginnings of the, the jhanas. So this is big stuff. So I warn you about that, but just go through it. When I said that I don't think how, don't know how any human being could take so much bliss, you can. There's no limit. You go for it. Nibbana Paramahansukha, Nibbana is the highest happiness. But, obviously you're going to get attached. And the Buddha said, I often quote this, I think it's in the word of the Buddha there somewhere. Let me get it out. Let's have this with it. Yes, I'll take a couple of minutes. He said, specifically from the Pasadika Sutta, the Sindhijana stuff. Oh yeah, here we go. Let's have a page 49 if you want to check it out. The Rajunda is four kinds of life devoted to pleasure that are entirely conducive to repulsion, fading away, cessation, peace, realization, enlightenment, to Nibbana. What are they? The four jhanas. So devotees of other sects should say that the Buddhists are addicted to these four forms of pleasure seeking. They should be told, yes, we are, we confess, we're addicted to pleasure. <laughs> correct, for the pleasures of the deep meditations, for they will be speaking correctly of you. Then some people might further ask you, what benefits can you expect from a life attached to these four forms of pleasure seeking? The word for attachments, which I 
which I have translated as attachment is uh, Anu Yunjati. Bitter means yoked along with. Um, what can you expect? What benefits from these four forms of pleasure seeking? You should reply that they can only expect one of four fruits. This is what happens if you get attached to the giants. Streaming, once returning, non returning, or full enlightenment. The four stages of enlightenment. In the Buddha's words, what you can expect. These are the benefits you can expect from being attached to these four forms of pleasure seeking. Not bad, is it? <laughs> Have a bliss better than heroin and sex and get enlightened as well. Pretty good deal. <laughs> the only thing is you have to disappear and vanish. So anyway, so this is where you see these incredible beautiful I'm doing the I'm not, I'm not doing the, the last side of side of just the, the lotus opening up. It's incredible blissful layers of lotus petals. Beautiful images, they stabilise. Where is the jhana? Right in the centre of the limitus. You just go in. Sometimes you're afraid to go in. You have to lose a lot of control. Really let go big time. And as you go in, you go into the realm of the jhanas. Inside the first jhana is the second, the second is the third, the third, inside that is the fourth. Deeper and deeper into the lotus. Go deeper and deeper inside. And maybe another day, describe what those jhanas are, but yeah, necessary. If within a jhana you start to think, this is a jhana, this is not a jhana, it cannot be. There's no possibility of thinking, of forming any concept inside a jhana. There's no possibility of will being formed to make a decision. All those things are gone. In the first jhana, if you hear the sound outside, you're out of the jhana. And sometimes the pull of the jhana is so strong, you go straight back in again. The jhana's first jhana is susceptible to sound. Only a weak first jhana. You go deep into the jhana, you can't hear anything. Your five senses are shut down. One of the reasons why it's blissful. The body is totally gone. What a relief. The second jhana, the thing which stands out, the will. See what I keep saying? Choice, will, you can't do anything. Such a relief. You can't do it. You're still, really still, big time still. And as you go into, it just happens, you just, Fall in into a third jhana. And then the third jhana is just happiness has got a totally different meaning. Fourth jhana can't be more still and aware than that. That is where the awareness reaches its peak. And as you they go deeper into these weird petals called the Avarupas, that's where consciousness the mind starts to disintegrate, starts to fade away. That's why the mindfulness starts to disappear, together with the rest of the mind consciousness. Fading, fading and fading. Until the fourth hour of her, call it either perception or not perception. Looking at it from this angle, it's nothing to experience. From that angle, you experience that there's nothing to experience. <coughs> Your mind is about to stop. Vanish. Poof. Cessation. So, when people ask, what is in the heart of the lotus? The answer is nothing. Nothing there. <coughs> Empty, gone, poof, nothing there. When I 
Someone said, you have to let go of stuff. You don't know how much letting go you have to do. The whole kaboodle. So, wow. Just respect reverence to the jewel in the heart of the lotus. Nothing there. Go. Oh, what a relief. I'm sure I'm going to get some questions about that tonight. But for now, sorry. Sorry.